Hello and welcome to week 12 of Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be studying social psychology. The way I like to think about social psychology is really just a blend between psychology and sociology. You know, I have a total biopsychosocial approach to the human sciences. I'm obsessed with understanding how our genetics, you know, and our bodies motivate and drive us, how our brain structure operates and how our cognitions function, and then how the social context influences our behavior. And then, you know, think about something like your identity. So your identity is influenced by your genetics, your DNA, okay? It's also influenced by the way your brain works. And it's also influenced by the social context, your experiences in life, how you were socialized, the culture you were socialized. But then going the other way, the culture you're socialized into and the way you're socialized then affects your brain and how your brain functions and the way it operates and the way you think, okay? And then all of this then epigenetically then influences your genes and the gene expression. So it's a big giant picture. But social psychology is really the focus of, you know, what's going on in the brain and how is that influenced by the social context. And then it's also looking at factors like group effects and social behavior, okay? So there's a lot to social psychology, which is, you know, when we get into personality and things, we'll get a little bit more into identity theory and things along those lines. But for example, the groups you belong to, such as being a male or a, f a female, or being of a race, white or black, even though as a sociologist I don't do race, and I don't, you know, I know very well that races are inaccurate categorizations of people that are based upon non-medical, non-biological facts, okay? So race itself should be questioned, but your identity is based upon what group you think you belong to. So if you think you belong to a group of women and you think you belong to a group of black people, for example, then you got to ask yourself how is belonging to those groups, how is interacting with those groups influencing the way I think. And again, that's the way I that's why I don't really like race personally because the second you call yourself white, for example, all of a sudden you're limiting yourself from experiencing an entire other way of life, which is black. And then you have to say, are black and white people actually different? And then you have to get into biology and genes. And, you know, then you got to look into the socialization process. And, you know, is there how, what effects in the social context are experienced by people that are white and black? And is there a disparity? You know, there's this big giant picture. And you guys should be thinking about all of these factors throughout studying the social sciences, okay? All right. So, the chapter begins talking about Kohlberg and morality. And the question is, how much of reality, again, is your biological responses? And how much of reality is your cognitions? And how much of reality and your morality is based upon how you have learned to respond to certain situations in the social context, such as learning what is right and wrong. Because what is right and wrong, what is moral and what is immoral is culturally defined. Even if we have these biological universals, such as not killing babies, for example. You know, you could probably argue that there's an evolutionary adaptation to us not killing babies. However, humans do kill other humans. What's going on there? Okay, why do humans kill other humans? You know, so they talk about a bunch of really interesting moral questions. It brings up the prisoner's dilemma. Um, how do we get along with other people? And so all of this question really sets up this idea of group interaction and group dynamics. First, do humans need groups? Yes, we need groups. Just to fulfill basic attachment needs, such as support and love and having this emotional connection and bonding. You know, children that are not interacted with become feral and have developmental disability issues, for example, okay? So all of us need groups. So one big question is, how is it that we interact in groups? How do we communicate? How do we work together? And then what are the rules, okay? And again, the rules are all culturally defined with the exceptions of those basic biological rules that we might have and are limited by our biology, for example, okay? So the Kohlberg thing really discusses the idea of whether we should focus on why we make decisions, when we're questioning moral actions and then acting on them, 
or should we focus more on just the action itself to really understand? And again, it's a biopsychosocial process. We all respond to certain things. You know, if Adolf Hitler is coming for you, you know, what do you do? You just automatically respond by picking up a gun and going and fighting the Nazis, for example. But then the question of whether or not that's moral is a whole other question. Is it moral for a soldier to kill? But is it moral for a serial killer to kill? What's the difference between a soldier and a serial killer? And now you're starting to get into some deep philosophical questions. You know, the basis for our actions. What is normal behavior and what is abnormal behavior? Is being a soldier normal behavior? Is that a normal form of killing? And then is a serial killer an abnormal? Someone who can't get along with society that's not following the rules? So again, a basic question we're asking through all of this is, how do we behave in social interaction and how has society, groups of people, influenced the way we behave, okay? So again, morality is one of those questions that are highly influenced by biological and psychological responses, but also the way that social action and behavior is constructed in the social context, okay? So then another idea is this idea of altruism. You know, why do we help people? And again, there's a lot of evolutionary adaptations to human beings social. So a lot of our behaviors such as altruism can be argued that it is an evolutionary biological adaptation. This idea to work with other people, to give up things that we have. For example, vampire bats and humans both, when we have extras, we tend to give it away, okay? We kind of invest that into our group. But what happens to the vampire bat that has extra and doesn't share? What happens is the next time around, the vampire bats actually starve that vampire bat. This is just basic animal science and biology, but humans have these same mechanisms built in. We will help people, but then if they don't help us, do we continue to help them? Is helping people part of like an evolutionary adaptation that increases the likelihood of positive social interaction and through positive social interaction can we increase the survival of our children and ourselves for example because do we have a vested interest in working together as a group and if so what's going on with the group dynamics how does that work how does humans interacting as groups actually operate okay so you have these basic rules these morals these norms, you have these altruistic behaviors, these social behaviors, we have acts of kindness and gestures like smile and communication and the way we use words. All of this is built into our biology and the way our brain functions and the way we interact in society, okay? Um, so again, that some of the stuff that the book talks about is great, like the prisoner's dilemma, and you can take this in all kinds of ways. And it's really a question, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis, you know, so again, altruism, giving up things that you have, sharing, working with others, a lot of this is based upon a cost-benefit analysis, which is kind of like economics, okay, and so that's really interesting that the book talks about. Okay, so other group effects that the book talks about is this idea of the bystander effect. For example, if somebody is injured on the street and you're the only one that's around, you're more likely to call the police for help than if there's a ton of people around. So our reaction times are faster when it's just you and one other person than it is with the group. So there are these group effects upon behavior that we can't deny. We are all influenced by the groups that we belong to, hence this socialization into our identities and our ideas about values and ideologies. You know, all of this is based upon our influence by other people. But when there's a bystander incident and there's a ton of people, what happens is people all just assume that everybody else is taking care of it for them, so they're less likely to call their police. The book talks about other group effects, such as social loafing. When there's a group of people, we tend to work less hard than we do when we're on our own. And they've done this with rope pulling, and they measure how hard you pull a rope when it's just you pulling compared to how hard you pull a rope when there's other people. And we tend to pull the, ro the rope less, which again feeds into this idea of the iron cage of bureaucracy. And as society becomes more formalized and group interaction increases, our response times slow down, for example, okay? Uh, some other interesting things the book talks about is first impression. So all of us are assessing each other constantly. Again, who we are, our identity is based upon how we think other people feel about us. 
So we're constantly analyzing other people in the social context and making impressions upon them to make sense of the stimuli of that person that we are experiencing, okay? So we can perceive who that person is as a person to understand how the interaction is going to go, for example. So as we discussed previously in another chapter, we have this thing called the primacy effect, and we talked about it when it comes to studying and memory. But again, the very first thing you see becomes very strongly embedded in your memory, more than information you might learn later about that person. Therefore, we all tend to judge based upon first impressions. And this is where the idea of stereotypes start to come in because we all have these stereotypes about other people. So the second you see that someone's female or that someone is white or that someone is Hindu, you start to make assumptions about that person. And those can be highly influenced by negative stereotypes. Now stereotypes in general are just ways of navigating the world. We have to have prototypes for the way things work. <clears throat> but that some of the stereotypes we have are very negative. Some of the prototypes that we use to make sense of reality are negative and they can cause a lot of harm. So again, this idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy is this idea that expectations that increase the probability of the event can be influenced by things like self-handicapping, for example. So if you go to tell a woman, for example, before they take a math test that men are better at math than women, that will set into their minds and then they will feed into this self-fulfilling prophecy that women aren't as good at math as men, which is completely inaccurate. Okay. So this idea of stereotypes or beliefs or expectations about a group of people and they can come in the form of that can become prejudicial when they are negative attitudes toward a group of people and stereotypes can be acted upon in a discriminatory way when you use actions to um, impose unequal treatment on groups of people, okay? So again, you have these major group effects in that we learn what groups we are belong to. Then we learn how you're supposed to behave according to the social norms of the group. And then the groups you belong to are associated with your social class location. So where you're located in society compared to other people in the hierarchically stratified class system is often based upon where you belong to in groups like sex, who has more power, males or females, race, who has more power, whites or non-whites, um, you know, social class, who has more power, those with property or those that doesn't. Who has more power, someone with an education, someone that doesn't, okay? And so depending on where you're located in these groups determines your life chances, your overall access to opportunities and goods, but stereotypes negatively affect people's access, okay? So if we have negative stereotypes about women, then the people that are doing the interviewing might be biased, prejudicial toward women, and then act in a discriminatory way by denying them access to the job. Okay, so again, group effects, group influence, how we're all influenced by the social context and the structures that exist in the social context. Again, that's that blend of sociology and psychology, okay? All of us have bias. We all have prejudice, even if we don't want to deny it. And so the book talks about the implicit association test, and this test was done by millions of people. It's like, I think, the most uh, filled out, um, study ever done, okay? And this shows that in the U.S., for example, people have an implicit bias that they favor whites. Even African Americans have an implicit bias toward whites. And this is because white, white privilege has been socialized in a society for so long that even minority groups have bought into this idea. And this has dramatic effects, again, on this idea of social like, class location because where you belong to in specific groups is associated with how much prejudice and discrimination and oppression you might experience in life, for example, okay? Um, so ways of decreasing prejudice, again, deconstructing negative stereotypes, changing the meaning attached to difference, okay? Changing the negative meaning is attached, the negative things that you've heard in your life, for example. Interacting with other people from different groups, becoming exposed, having high proximity levels, creating access. There's so many ways to decrease prejudice, but really it comes down to this idea of changing attitudes to develop a more multicultural, diversity-embracing planet. Where we all embrace our differences, but we don't categorize our differences according to inaccurate categories such as race, which then is really all about privilege, power, and oppression, and economics. Because core of race is about money. 
it's all about Europeans dominating non-Europeans. They want the money. They want to subjugate other people into the lower classes. So race was created as a measure of which social class you're allowed to belong to. Okay? The book talks about attributions, and it gets into a lot of the ways that we rationalize behavior of our behavior and other people's behavior. So attributions are the set of thought processes we use to assign causes to our behavior and that of others. We make internal attributions, which means we try to explain an attitude based upon a person's character. So for example, if I did well on an exam, you would say something like, that person's so smart. That's an internal attribution. Okay, an external attribution is blaming the situation or having the situation account for the factor. So if I took an exam and I did a really good job, an external attribution might be that that test wasn't so hard. It wasn't an internal attribution like I studied so much it was, you know, that test wasn't that complicated. That's why everybody else did good, okay? So you need to know the difference between internal and external attributions, the way that we account for the way things happen. Internal is saying, you know, it's that person's character that's responsible. External is saying the situation is responsible, okay? The uh, actor-observer effect is like, for example, if we tend to make a mistake, like if I did a bad job on my exam, I wouldn't blame myself and make an internal attribution. I would make an external attribution by saying that test was way too hard or the professor put a bunch of stuff on that test that we didn't even talk about, you know, that kind of stuff. You would blame it on the situation so that you can, you know, deflect any negativity from yourself and that's a way of making yourself look better to create a positive impression of yourself. And the fundamental attribution error is that when we go to look at other people and say why is their predicament the way it is, we tend to exclude the situation and focus more on internal characteristics such as, you know, what is it about that person? Is it that person that did bad in the exam? Not that that teacher didn't do a good job. Okay. There are cultural differences in attribution because, again, the way we frame things is based upon how we're socialized into a culture, a way of life consisting of beliefs and ideologies and material culture, okay? Uh, we've talked again about self-serving biases and self-handicapping strategies. Again, self-serving biases is when we try to convince ourselves that, you know, it's not our fault, it's somebody else's fault. And then self-handicapping strategies is where you set yourself up for failure you know, just because in case you do fail, you want to, you know, you want yourself covered when that happens, okay? So again, attitudes and behavior influence our attributions and the way we, you know, account for the way things work, okay? And so our prejudice and our discrimination and our stereotypes, again, are all influenced by our attitudes towards something, our likes or dislikes that have influenced our behavior, okay? The book talks about cognitive dissonance, which is an incredibly important concept. And again, this is the idea of your reality being matching or not matching your expectations. So like, again, if you go to college and you got the job you wanted, you probably won't have a lot of cognitive dissonance regarding that. You're probably happy about that. However, if you went to college and then you didn't end up doing what you wanted to do, you might experience cognitive dissonance. Okay, and this is this state of unpleasantness or anxiety, tension, when, you know, your reality doesn't match with your expectations. And this can also happen in situations like anger and aggression, or you're not getting along with someone, for example. You expect them to be a certain way when they don't expect, they don't act that way. You then experience cognitive dissonance, and then you seek ways to make your reality match your expectations to reduce distress, for example, okay? So again, I experienced distress. Uh, you know, by not being a college professor. And then when I became a college professor, all that just kind of went away, you know. So, you know, that's something to think about, you know. So, all right. Relationships is another thing your book talks about, and I really like studying relationships. You can look at those romantic pair bonding relationships, or you can look at it from the triangular theory of love. But again, who you're with and who you establish connections with, whether it's a romantic partner or a friend or an acquaintance or just somebody in a secondary group, for example, a lot of it's based upon proximity and familiarity. The people that you're around, the people that you know, and the people you're located with, those are the people you end up with. So is soulmate really a thing or is it more about location? We are very interested in physical attractiveness. 
something about attractiveness in humans, whether it's biology, saying that person's attractive, that means they have less disease and illness in their DNA, to how beauty is constructed in reality. We are, you know, superficially obsessed with attractiveness. People hire based upon attractiveness. It matters to humans for some reason, you know, and that's a really good debate. So, but that's part of relationships, even if you don't want to admit it or not. The book does a good job of covering that. Uh, how similar are you to somebody? This idea of cost and benefits, the exchange theory of relationships, you know, how has dating changed in modern times, you know, with technology? Is it interpersonal? Is it, you know, losing that? You know, so there's just a lot of really good stuff if you guys are interested in group dynamics relating to relationships, both romance and acquaintance and just, you know, general friends. Um, the book also talks about marriage and long-term commitments. And again, why do we get in marriage and long-term commitments? And I'm really interested in this subject because you have reward systems built into your brain for, you know, like a hookup, for example. You get rewards from that in your brain, like the release of dopamine. However, you get a lot more when you're in monogamous relationships. So why do we get in relationships in the first place? Is it for survival of the fittest, taking care of their children? Is it for attachment needs? You know, some really good debates there when it comes to why we get into relationships in the first place. But then you got to also think about, you know, your relationship is influenced by proximity. So again, your race, for example, is a factor in who you marry, even if we don't want to admit it. So there's all these other social context factors that influence the relationships that we get in and who we're exposed to in the first place, okay? So there's a lot to this, and you can study this if you take some family classes and stuff, for example. Um, but again, that's really interesting. Social influence, the core of all of this is all of us are influenced by other people. Whether we want to be or not, we are influenced by other people. We are all wondering what other people are thinking of us all the time. We're all thinking about how they think of us, and we're thinking about how we think about them. Social interaction is built into us. It is a drive. It is a motivation, just like hunger, okay? However, we are subjected to the influence of other people. And then that's where you get into these ideas about conformity, as most of us conform to the social norms, even if... We disagree with it, okay? And it's just part of us is that we want to be liked. We want to be able to interact with the group. We want people to want to be around us. So we tend to conform to the behaviors and expectations of the group, which is where things like gender roles come in. You know, men are expected to be a certain way. When you don't act that way, when you don't conform to masculinity, people might make fun of you and not want to be around you. And that's the negative stereotypes again coming into play. So all of us, whether we want to or not, tend to match our behavior to that of the social group. Okay? There is then the idea of deviance, what happens when you violate social norms. And then you have ideas like social control that get built into there. So us following the norms, doing what we're supposed to, what we're expected to do, is highly ingrained in us as we interact with society. And so you have the three experiments, Osh, Zimbardo, and Milgram. Osh did the great experiment with the rulers, and what he did was he had somebody come into the room, and uh, everybody else that was in the room, they were all part of the experiment. They were, we were working the experiment. <clears throat> and they would ask people, how long is this ruler? And they would all say the wrong answer. And the one person that came in that was being experimented on, uh, the participant, they would look around and know that the ruler was incorrect, but yet they would just say whatever the group did, you know, just because they wanted to follow the group. Or there's the great elevator experiment where everybody walks into the elevator, but instead of turning around, they all stay facing the back wall. And then they have a person that's a participant come into the elevator, and that person looks and looks, but instead of turning around, they just end up facing the wall too. You know, we all follow in line, whether we want to or not. Uh, Stanley Milgram, he did the electric shock and he, you know, showed how people are influenced by authority when we're told to do something, even if it goes against us, even if we're experiencing that cognitive dissonance, um, we still follow it out a lot of the time, okay? And that kind of accounts for like why the Germans didn't stop, you know, the, the Nazis from the Holocaust, 
why did everyone just let it happen? Okay, and that's kind of where Milgram was coming in because he wanted to know, and your book talks about that, okay? And then Zimbardo did the prison experience of experiments and showed what would happen when you put people in positions of authority and how does that influence conformity, for example, okay? Uh, so again, we are all influenced by the group and sometimes this can lead to bad things like polarization and groupthink. So again, if people become too polarized too one way, you tend to not have new information and things become stagnant. You need that diversity just to stir the pot up. And then groupthink is when people, even if they don't agree with the group, again, we tend to just agree with the group and suppress any of our you know, anti-group, things that go against what they're saying, attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, because we don't want to cause any conflict, because we're afraid sometimes to disagree with someone because we're afraid they might not like us, okay? So again, this chapter is chock full of tons of stuff. Social psychology is such a deep concept. Um, there's just a lot to it, but again, this is just a quick introduction. It's introduction to psychology. There are whole classes on this. I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture today. Um, if there's anything you need, please just give me a call or just email. It's an honor. Thank you so much.